chain, or sorry, forge, chapter 23. We performed the last duty for the dead on the last day of the year. We heated water to wash ourselves. Civilness, Greenlaw, John Burns, and Aaron Berry shaved the best they could without soap. I used my knife to scrape off the few hairs that grew on my chin and under my nose. The rest were still beardless. We knocked the mud off of our clothes and our hair and tied clean to our boots and, sh and tried to clean our boots and shoes. We did not have any black cloth to wear around our arms. Faulkner came up with the idea of marking our sleeves halfway between the wrist and the elbow with a heavy line of charcoal to show our mourning. The graveyard was hidden in a small clearing in the deep, uh, deep in the woods near General, General Wayne's regiment, tucked out of sight so the British spies would not know how many of our army had died. For that reason, too, there were no crosses or headstones to mark the graves. The quiet mounds of snow would settle by spring. The enemy would never count the uh, these dead. We dug the grave in shifts except for Eben, who did not stop shoveling, sweating, or shivering until the man-sized hole was deep enough. He never wiped away the tears that washed his face, nor did he speak a word to any soul. The pines around us bent in, in the heavy wind. When the grave was ready, the litter carried from... The hospital tent to the grave by Henry Greenlaw, Eben, and me, a bleak march across the Grand Parade and past the south-facing cannons of the artillery park down to the Baptist Road. The sergeant's face and naked body was covered by a blanket, all except his one dirty foot. Clothes were too precious to be wasted on the dead. Sergeant Woodruff would go to his eternal reward bearing what he had been born in. Every soldier removed his hat when we approached. The, woman of the, or the women of the camp bowed their heads. As soon as we passed them by, they all went back to work. We sat the litter next to the hole. Uh, Eben walked away and started or stared into the woods while we picked up his uncle and laid him in the ground and removed the blanket. When we were dead, he came back for a short service. The chaplain read from his Bible in a quiet voice that was hard to hear over the sound of the winds and trees. There could be no firing of guns in his honor. The ammunition had to be saved for the enemy. When he closed the book, Captain Stanwell nodded. Civilness Greenlaw and me picked up the earth or picked up the shovelful of dirt and began to fill the grave. No, wait. Eben said. The captain put his hand on Ebenezer or on Eben's shoulder. Mayhaps you should head back to camp. Not yet, sir. Give me one moment. We put the shovels down without waiting for the captain's reply. Eben's unbuttoned his coat, his uncle's coat, now his, and slipped one arm free of it. Does anyone have a blade? We all shook our heads at this unsettling question. Burns whispered something into Aaron's ears, and uh, crows called from the swaying branches above. Why do you need a blade, lad? The chaplain uh, gently asked, to keep the dirt from his face. Eben wiped his eyes on his shirt sleeve and grabbed the fabric and pulled so hard that the sleeve ripped at the shoulder. He pulled again and all the stitches gave way, and then he peeled off the sleeve, stuck his naked arm back in the coat, and buttoned it. Can you read that prayer again? The chaplain figure, uh, fingered through the pages in search of the right passage. When he began reading, Ebenezer Woodruff folded his sleeve once, knelt, and laid it across the face of his uncle. He stood and looked across the open grave. Wait till you can't see me before you start. That night was my turn to stand guard. Halfway through the watch, Eben appeared out of gloom with an armful of firewood. I took the wood from him and heaped it onto the fire and sat on the log next to him. Eben sniffed in the dark and drew uh, shaky breaths. He did not speak until all the wood blazed and crackled. I got in another fight. Burns? No, cousin Aaron. He said I had no right to cry on account of Uncle Caleb wasn't my father. I swung at him and he punched back and I lost track of myself. Next thing I knew, fellows were pulling me off of him and I'm very certain I broke his nose. He sniffed again and made a gulping noise. Uncle would be disappointed in me for fighting like that. Did you live in his house? I even cleared his throat. My father found himself a pretty widow after my mother died and sent me to Uncle Caleb's. How old were you? Five years and seven months. Aunt, uh, Uncle Caleb and Aunt Patience didn't have any children. They wanted me to be their son. When we enlisted, Aunt Patience made us promise not to get shot and to come home as soon as the war was over. The log shifted and sparks flew. I almost told him all my secrets then because he told me his. More sparks flew, and then I came to my senses. Can I punch Aaron too? I asked. Don't. You'll hurt your hand. He pressed his finger into uh, against one nostril and blew out snot and then wiped his nose on his sleeve. All the berries got cast iron heads. 
We sat knee to knee, breathing in the cold air and blowing out frost the rest of the night. Above us, the sky from the year of our Lord, 1777, passed into the year of our Lord, 1778, in darkness, and someone had stolen the moon from the sky.